everybody. Welcome to Experts Dig In with Doggies for Dementia. I am Carmen DeVelis and the founder of Doggies for Dementia. And we have a wonderful guest today, Brittany Dreyer. Welcome, Brittany. Hi, Carmen. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm so excited to chat with you. Oh my gosh, my pleasure. I want to just go into my short spiel about Doggies for Dementia. Then we're going to jump right in because we've got an exciting show today. Uh, I just know it's going to be so interesting. And I'm, um, we have purposefully not talked about a few things just so it could be fresh on the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, Doggies for Dementia is a 501c3 nonprofit. And our missions are really to big time raise awareness to help teach the world about dementia. Uh, we firmly believe that the world can be a much more kind and compassionate place for those impacted by dementia. And we educate the world by showing images and sharing stories. And um, you know, my, it's kind of a, you think like raising awareness and teaching, well, that's kind of you know soft and fluffy type things, but man, the impact of stigma is huge. And um, it's emotional and physical. And, um, and so we have two, basically two programs when we send uh, professional photographers to people, um, to families, and we photograph them with their dogs. And we also invite families to submit photos to us so that we can highlight your loved one, share those photos and stories. Um, stories are big for us. And uh, that's a quick recap of Doggies for Dementia. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So Brittany, um, oh my gosh. So I want to, you know, I want to say we met through Instagram, I believe. Is yeah. That Instagram yes, Facebook? we did. <laughs> yeah. And um, had the opportunity to chat, which is um, for all the negative stuff about social media, I've got to say, especially the last two years, I have just met the most wonderful people and connected in social media and um, the the uh, the results of that are just huge. And so not only did I learn about your company, Picnic Health, which we're gonna talk about because you're the community partnership manager, correct? Yeah, you got it. Yay, that's a mouthful. Oh, yeah, and we're, we're gonna talk about that because I love Picnic Health and I wanna, I wanna uh, definitely talk about that, but also, um, you're, you were caregiver for your mother who had Alzheimer's disease, right? And just recently right. passed. Yep. Yeah, yep. just recently. Are you okay to talk about that a little bit? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I love sharing about my mother and about our journey. And, you know, part of advocacy is hoping that by sharing your story, you can empower others as well. So, yeah. Well, let's begin with that then. Um, did you have caregiver experience before becoming a caregiver? Actually, I did. So uh -huh. when I first graduated from a college, um, I thought that I wanted to go into nursing. Um, so I actually worked at a facility for a little bit as a CNA. Uh, what happened to me was I found out that my heart like was just, it could not take the day to day. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, at least at that time, we were kind of thrown into the fire caring for those that have cognitive decline or living with dementia. And there were, it was just like, okay, you have to get them to do these specific things, mm -hmm. but there was no training surrounding how to communicate with them. Um, and it just was something that like broke my heart every day, having to go in and feel like you were, you know, doing a battle for someone. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, that was like really my my only introduction to caregiving. And then when my mother was diagnosed, initially they chose not to tell me. <laughs> How so, old were you, Brittany, when your mother was diagnosed? Uh, let's see, it was about six years ago that they finally told me. And then she was diagnosed a few years before that. So I was probably in my mid twenties, I would wow. say. Um, but yeah, my mom always wanted to protect me from like the hard things. So she initially didn't tell me. And then when it started to get more serious and we were, I was noticing things that were going on. That's when the diagnosis finally came out. So before you go on, I just have to ask then, um, so they did, you weren't, you weren't in the know beforehand. What no. do you think about that? So, you know, I obviously families ask, should we say something? Should we wait? Who do we tell? 
I would have liked to have known for multiple reasons um, yeah. so that I could prepare myself mentally. And so I could have been like more involved in the diagnosis journey, which I'm sure I'll talk a little bit about later, but I feel like I didn't get the opportunity to really participate and know what was coming. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was kind of funny. I guess my mom found out, you know, and they didn't tell me, but she had actually like purchased books for everybody in the family about like what Alzheimer's would look like and how, you know, how to communicate, but she didn't give it to me. So <laughs> buying <laughs> books for creative. people is like something I would do. And yeah, I understand the point of wanting to protect. Um, on yeah. the other hand, that denied you that opportunity. Uh, it did. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, boy, moms, we try to do our best. <laughs> she really always wanted to protect me from anything awful that was happening, which I understand. I just, yeah. I just wish I would have known. <laughs> yeah. So, did she have early onset? I mean, was she younger when she was diagnosed? Uh, she was. She was in her mid 60s. And I would say, like, in her 50s, honestly, she started to show signs of cognitive decline. Uh -huh. Um, but it was just something that we just, that's just, you know, that's just Donnie. That's who mm -hmm. she is. Mm -hmm. um, and then looking back on it later, it's like, oh my gosh. And she used to always say like, I feel like there's something wrong with my brain. Like, I feel like I'm getting Alzheimer's and we would just dismiss it. Mm -hmm. um, and now she was, she was right. She and was she knew, right. you know, yeah. so. And was it in other members already? Or was your mom the first that you knew of in the family? Uh, my grandmother had some cognitive decline, but she never, I don't think received an official diagnosis, but definitely some similar themes there. Mm, okay. Wow. Well, that's a lot for someone in their mid twenties. Yes. <laughs> I think, yeah. I mean, that's a lot for anybody, but I, I think of myself in my mid twenties and, um, I know younger people are becoming caregivers more yeah. and more. I've, I've witnessed that. And, I think, wow, when I was in my mid twenties, how would I have handled that? Um, I was already a nurse, but I think back, I'm like, I thought I knew a lot more than I did about life. Oh yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, now I look back and go, what was I thinking? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so you're a caregiver for how long, how, how long then? Like five long? years that I knew. Um, and then really the decline was pretty slow. And then I would say around the beginning of COVID, it just became steep. Oh. Um, and in the last few months, I mean, she couldn't communicate at all, except for read what she had written down mm -hmm. in a phone book. Um, so she would call me to read that, or she would call to read like the headlines on the TV. Um, so, oh. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so you have a pretty good understanding then. I mean, you're, you're working with people likely with some health issues now. And so, yeah. 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 So um, how did this lead to where you're doing with your life now career wise? Yeah, absolutely. So I got involved in patient advocacy about two years ago. I have Tourette syndrome. Um, and I saw on Instagram, people were sharing their like patient stories and participating in panels. And I definitely wanted to be a part of that as a member of the community, um, because I wanted to help other people that were going through similar things. Yeah. And at the time I wasn't really sharing about my mom. Um, and because I wanted to be respectful of her and I was just kind of in the dark because there is such a stigma, like you said earlier yeah. about Alzheimer's and dementia, yeah. um, like when my mom did tell me or my parents told me, they were like, don't talk about it. Cause I put everything on my social media. That's just who I am mm -hmm. as a person. I'm like, this is my life here. Come, come mm -hmm. view it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they were like, do not talk about it. We don't want anybody to know. Um, and they were very like close off about sharing. Why, uh, why, why do you think that what, what were their reasonings for it? Keeping it to know. themselves. Like, I think they were just fearful and they didn't want the perception of who my mom is to change in other people's eyes mm -hmm. or like have like that pity, I think. Um, and they just wanted to keep things as normal as possible. I think there's mm -hmm. when you're first diagnosed, there's so much fear of the unknown of what mm -hmm. the progression is going to look like. Cause it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a unique story, um, that it can just kind of 
yeah know, yeah down. yeah I love that point about perception because um when we do have a problem it does and we we make it vocal it does change how people see us because it's a part of the story that they didn't have before yeah. and yeah. um uh, when I hear that, I'm like, I totally get that. Um, Cause like in the, during the pandemic, I was diagnosed with cancer, like in the March, the very early days and I'm fine. And I went through that, but I debated, do I say something? Because I don't want to feel like, um, I didn't want that part of, to define me. In other words, I didn't yeah. want that to be part of, mm-hmm. and I thought, well, you know, it's part of my story right now, honestly. And I still am who I am, but yeah. Um, there's just no way to share a part, a very personal part of your journey of your life, what's happening, and for it not to become um, a part of others' perceptions and however they choose to perceive it, right? Which you have no control of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and when it comes to Alzheimer's, the the stigma is such that there's so much shame around it, and um, you know all the and the we're so afraid of the unknown you just Mm -hmm. don't know how it's going to be perceived and yeah yeah. so I totally get that yeah there was definitely a lot of fear for my parents for sure um so yeah that's kind of like my my background of how I got into patient advocacy and then um I became really interested and a huge advocate for research Mm-hmm. which I know is like not the the coolest topic in the world to be passionate about, but I am very passionate mm-hmm. about it yeah. um, because I think it's the only way that, you know, things will change um, for patients. And I'm also very passionate about everybody getting a chance to sit at the table in research yeah. and make sure that patient voice is included. That's mm-hmm. mainly what I'm, I'm there for every day. Right. You know, so I, what I, some people may not know that when it comes to research with regard to Alzheimer's and and other types of dementia, there are clinical trials uh, available that that's great. And they're usually for, well, there's a variety of things, but a lot of them have to do with medications that are being tried before they're uh, available to be prescribed to everyone but they're not available to everybody. There's criteria if you can get to the site where the clinical trial is. So there may be some travel involved, which is not easy for most people. And there's expense involved and it's, there's no guarantee. Well, there's never a guarantee, but it's, um, it's, there's a lot of emotion tied up in it, uh, and, and challenges. Yeah, absolutely. And I think especially when you're a caregiver for someone with dementia, traveling and participating in something like that can be, you know, it's a huge undertaking. It's something, to be honest, that I couldn't have done with my mother. And I know that she did want to participate in research, um, but it was just near the end, something that we couldn't do. And we live in a rural community in Washington. Like Mm. (laughs) there's no sites around us. No sites. And and truthfully, what you said about the challenges, even if you were in a city where the trials are, it is not easy to get in to, I mean, getting into the car and making a trip. It's, it's very, um, you just don't know. It could be really frightening for the person who has dementia, who's not sure what's going on. I mean, there's a yeah. Okay. So you said you love that you could bring uh, that other people can come to the table to yeah. participate and to have their, um, to, to have a, um, a voice. Make it help. Yes. A voice and to make a difference. Yeah. I, I, we have to hear about that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, that's a good segue into the role that I'm currently in now. So I work for Picnic Health. I'm a community partnerships manager. Uh, Just a little bit of background for anybody who's not familiar. Uh, Picnic Health was founded seven years ago when our CEO, Noga Levener, was diagnosed with Crohn's. And at the time, she was trying to seek multiple opinions. She just got this diagnosis. And instead of moving forward for advocating for herself, she was on the phone trying to get her medical records, waiting in line, trying to get her medical records. And she saw that system and said, this is broken. We need to fix it. Medical records are the right of every patient. And that's how Picnic Health was born. 
So one of the things that we offer at Picnic Health is our digital health timeline, which is all of your medical records in one place um, in a digital format. You can search it, you can share it with other members of your care team. Like for my mother, she could share it. My father could share her records with me and then I could actively be involved in that mm -hmm. process um, because mm -hmm. I was long distance. Or, you know, in the case of an emergency, you'd be able to share that with the emergency staff and they could search within the medical record for something that they need. I know you were um, a former RN mm -hmm. and I'm sure like some records are so, you know, thick that you just, in an emergency situation, you simply don't have time to go through every single thing. So, right. yeah. Yeah. And you know, that sounds, wow, that's a really great thing. And that's really nice, but truly that's life saving. Yep. It's life saving to have anyone who's had specialists or who moves from one place to another changes yep. doctors, your insurance changes, things happen to not have access to the past things means uh, that, that other providers working with less than the picture that they need to make yep. good decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, you know, your tests have to be reran because they don't have access to it. It's a whole mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, um, so, so much with that, so much. Yeah, yeah, I'm very excited to be working at Picnic Health and share about the timeline because I know as a caregiver, it's literally just a game changer to be able mm -hmm. to have. Um, so important. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So that's a huge thing. And then there's more. And then um, there's more. There's a wait, my, there's more. <laughs> yeah. The research. My original passion, um, yeah. which is research. So with Picnic Health, you do have the option uh, to contribute your medical records to researchers, and it is completely de-identified, um, and we combine it with other patients to get insights that can't be found in clinical trials for a few reasons. One, like you said, clinical trials have a lot of inclusion exclusion criteria. It's mm -hmm. difficult to get to them. Um, this is something that you can do from your home. It takes less than 10 minutes to sign up on our secure site. Uh, you get the awesome timeline and researchers get to see how dementia and cognitive decline looks actually in the real world, not the clinical, like clinical, you know, space. What does it actually look like? What are the patients going through? What does the progression look like? Um, and then, yeah, they get that full picture with everybody's story combined. And then that helps inform, you know, maybe clinical trials or maybe future treatments, or maybe just a further understanding of what it looks like. <laughs> so is the data that's collected then, is yeah. that primarily from appointments or is it also family input or, or, or a patient input if they're able about what, what's yeah. happening? That's a great question. Um, it's definitely both. So I would say the bulk of it is definitely the medical records and provider notes. Um, but also we do send out surveys to patients and their caregivers for them to fill out about their specific experience. Yeah, I would say, just, I just have a side note on like as a nurse practitioner at the time, I would have thought, oh, that's really great. But however, you know, I'm very thorough. I ask all the questions It's gonna be in my notes. And yeah. uh, when I left though, and I, I wrote a book and I followed families and some of the things that they told me, they never shared in the office. And when I mm -hmm. asked them, I'm like, what? You know, we would spend 30 or 45 minutes. She never shared with me some of your concerns or worries. And like, I was so afraid to tell you that you'd see me as this terrible daughter or this terrible caregiver, or you'd say, my mother probably needs a nursing home. There was just so much yeah. around what was actually shared, but they had more comfort in telling me when I, when I was writing a book and not the provider. Yeah. Um, yeah. You made I really, had no idea. No. Yeah. You yeah. made a really good point. I think, um, around some hesitance to share. I know this was definitely true for my father. He was so terrified that my mother was going to be removed from our home that he really tried to downplay um, in the later stages of her life how severe it was um, because she you know she didn't want to leave him and he was just terrified to have mm. her leave as well which is like 
God. But yeah. there definitely is that fear that patients, you know, maybe don't share with their providers because they don't want it to seem as bad as it truly is. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I'm putting myself in that circumstance and I'm, I'm pretty sure that no matter how much reassurance we're here to help you be successful at home, if that's what you wish, the, it's just, I can understand the fear of like, yeah, but, and so, yeah, yeah, I, I need to tell the story. Um, wow. That's a lot. That's a lot to carry. Yeah. A lot to carry. Yeah, I bet it feels kind of good to to be able to document some of that, you know, like someplace. And you oh, said absolutely. so. There's no, there's there isn't a way of connecting who it is, or you know, it, it's um, their their identity is protected, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did have the opportunity, you know, to have my mom participate in the study, so her voice is included, um, oh. and I'm very excited about that because you know, yeah. It would it would have been important to her. Um, it's so important. And- you know, I think this just it just wraps wraps all around the importance of the stories and yeah. um, the stories around what's happening and what we see and how we feel about it. Um, in order to the the more that is shared, it's like a burden lifted off in a sense. Mm-hmm. It's like okay, I'm not alone in this now. Yeah, Um, there's a risk with that, but you know, I'm not alone in that. And then when you're participating for research, then you know that other families that follow are going through the same thing. Their journey might be completely different because of what is contributed. And what a beautiful thing that is. What a beautiful legacy. Yeah, Yeah, I know why you love research. I'm a a little geeky too. I'm not saying you are geeky, but I'm a little geeky. I love research too. (laughs) <laughs> okay yeah. so I can say that yeah love the research for that reason because yeah. it impacts it impacts the future it really and, and does. the present for that matter but definitely the future it really does and I think the more that we get patients involved you know even at the very beginning of the process like if you're talking about clinical trials get them involved in study design make sure yeah. that they really understand the full picture and that's something great that picnic health can actually do to supplement they can give researchers the landscape of what it looks like and what Uh patients may be capable of. The more that we have that patient voice included, the better Mm -hmm. research will become. Um, So important. Yeah. yeah. You know, our system, well, in many ways is kind of a mess, but I really, (laughs) I really, you know, the one big thing that must, must change is the uh, contributions and the value that's placed on if the patient, the person, yeah. the family, their Absolutely. what they have to say and their journey. And so yeah. I love that. I love that. Well, we're going to have links to Picnic Health in there. Take a look and um, they'll see, you know, where to learn more about that and to ask those important questions. And, yeah. um, uh, you know, we, we hear, you know, Doggies for Dementia, we are all about the stories. We know yeah. you have dogs too. Yeah. Yeah. Many of them. <laughs> many, <laughs> many. And um, I can say both, it, neither of our households have had a uh, barking today, which is really a miracle here today. You just jinxed it, Carmen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's that? I said you just jinxed it. <laughs> I did. Maybe so. Maybe so. And um, I truly love how this has come, you know, almost full circle for you in this aspect that you know, from a, a caregiver, a, a young caregiver watch, watching and experiencing as family member with your mom, and then taking that and saying, boy, we're going to, these stories are going to make a difference. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then finding your place. Yeah. You know? I think that's nothing short of a miracle. Oh. That that's just what you needed right then. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. I just, I just, um, I just don't think coincidences are a coincidence. I think there's, it's just like, that just needed to happen. Absolutely. No, literally. Yeah. 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 And I'm so glad to connect with you. I love what you do at Doggies for Dementia. I mean, obviously I'm a dog lover, so that got (laughs) me right there. But, you know, in my work, I'm telling stories. In your work, Mm -hmm. you're telling stories. Mm -hmm. Um, And stories really are what ultimately I think makes the impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from forever. It's that's what carries on from generation to generation. And 
uh, just so important. And, and thank you for that. And uh, for those who wonder why doggies <laughs> and what does that have to do with dementia, we photograph people with their family dogs. And like you, you know, you need to go to where you the people are and like, what are people listening to and what are they interested in? And we found that when we, when we have post pictures on social media of people with dogs and maybe the same person without a dog, beautiful photo of the, the one with the dog, people would stop and read their stories and go, oh my gosh, and would share their own. Yeah. Um, yeah, because they, they saw the dog and they're like, oh my goodness, can I show you a picture of my dog? And then, the, <laughs> yeah. right. Then the connection begins. I'm like, oh, dogs are just, you know, we all love our dogs. We all love we our dogs. We don't them. We don't deserve <laughs> dogs in this world. They're so pure. They wow. are, they are. And, and, and in this sense, there's just like, they bring so much more than we could have ever asked. You know, they're connecting yeah. us. And, in, and making the world just a more beautiful and joyful place than we could have imagined. So, um, yeah. yeah, so I just love that. And um, I have loved chatting with you and hearing about your journey. And uh, yeah, for sure, we'll uh, put the links in there and, um, and a little bit about Picnic Health. And uh, we're going to see some of your family photos pretty soon. Yes, yes, My yes. wonderful mama and a couple of our dogs will be oh. there. I'm excited about that. So our, our program, the uh, See Me Project for families contributing photos and, and their stories. And um, it looks like you might be the first contributor to Brittany. Ooh, so yeah, yeah. So excited. <laughs> me too, me too. Um, well, thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions, pop them in the comments. And uh, we look forward to hearing more from you. Yeah, thanks, Carmen, so much thank for allowing so much. me to to tell my story. <laughs> uh, of course, it's a pleasure. Take care, guys. See you later.